But uh, perhaps um, Fiona could say a few words while we're waiting for people to join um, about the what the the Island Jura peatlands project is all about, what what it's trying to achieve. Okay. Um, the Island Jura peatland project is uh, an engagement project, basically that um, the CAN network um, are doing a lot of work on the Rins of Isla on a number of sites, clearing rhododendron and helping deer management on crucial kind of um, SAC sites on Isla. And so as an organization, Isla Natural History Trust has been contracted to undertake surveys the past three years on birds and marsh fritillaries. Um, and part of the, the culmination of their project is that we do engagement on Isla and highlighting the importance of peatland as a habitat and all the elements that go with it. So we've embraced that because it fits in with our ethos of um, promoting and educating folk to the wildlife and natural history on the island. Um, it suits um, all the elements that we do. So we're running training um, for um, species identification. So we have a sphagnum training course on tomorrow for um, kind of professional folk dealing in the peatland areas. And we'll open out to the general public for another session a bit later in the summer. And we've got a number of walks on. So we've got two walks this month um, taking folk out onto peatland and peat bog uh, next Thursday and the following Sunday. So a nice, a shorter walk onto um, Dulochs and showing people the importance of peatland and a, and a more arduous walk up uh, Castle Hill on the following Sunday. And it's really just to engage with folk, whatever peatland means to them. And <clears throat> The culmination of the whole summer is that we're running a competition for poetry and photography for people to kind of capture what peatland means to them in whatever form you know whether they they see see it and want to capture an image or they talk, want to talk about it so we've already had a talk from um laurie campbell last month and month before promoting sort of his experiences of photography, uh, photographing peatland areas, and very kindly Donald's agreed to give us a talk tonight to try and highlight the literary elements to peatland. But uh, hopefully the end of July, people have submitted all their entries and um, have nice surprises for people to, um, and, just, and we'll have a mobile exhibition to exhibit what people have entered throughout the island and move to different villages to try and engage folk wherever they are. So it's been the... great actually. I found it very... Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, it's, I've been surprised, but the Peatland project has been very um, illuminating for me because having been brought up in Lewis myself, um, I'd, I never really thought of Isla as a place of peatlands. I knew there were um, peat banks and so on here and they cut the peats for um, my, you know my mother's family used to cut the peats for Lothroig and I was aware that there was some peat production in Isla but I hadn't really realized how much of the island was actually basically moorland had you know was basically peat. you know, think because we all think of Isla as being the most fertile arable sort of place in the whole of the Hebrides but I think it's something is it right that it's about 60 percent of the island yeah I worked out I worked out looking on the map it's roughly about 60 percent of the land mass is under peatland um whether it be kind of bog or upland you know it's still significantly high um, despite all the farmland and other areas in the low ground so it's it's nice that we have a full range of habitats within our one island so um, Okay, so maybe are we ready to start with Donald? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just before we start, I just want to say we are, this is being streamed onto Facebook as well, so there are probably more people 
than just the, the 15 of us that are here at the moment on Zoom. So we are recording it and it's being broadcast live through the Isla Book Festival Facebook page. That's a first for me, I never tried that before. So hopefully it'll work. Okay, Angus, you're going to be introducing Donald, yeah? Well, I, th I thought Fiona was, but I can do briefly. I mean, Donald is a, you know, knows Isla well. He was he here in 2018 presenting his book about peatlands um, called The Dark Stuff, which, you know, is a fantastic read for anybody who's not seen it yet. And, uh, you know, over the last week or so, I've been sharing some of his poetry, a lot of which is influenced by the the landscapes of, of moorland and the the wildlife and so on and i believe he you know he, he told me he'd been working on a new collection of poetry i think we're going to hear some of that tonight um during lockdown and what else can i say i mean yeah i mean i i absolutely loved um uh Donald's first book, As a Woman Lay Dreaming, which won the Paul Torde Memorial Prize, I think it was. Um, and uh, I've not read In a Veil of Mist, which is his second novel, which had came out at the end of last year, but I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and that, you know, you, I think in the Hebrides today, there isn't a better sort of um, person doing that kind of nature writing and reportage about the cultural heritage and the you know, the, that kind of great block of history that informs, uh, you know, that really infuses our lives here with, for people who live in the Hebrides. So when Fiona asked me, you know, uh, who could we get to talk about writing about peatlands and peat, um, there was kind of unanim unanimity about where to go. So hence Donald is with us this evening. So over to you, Donald. Okay, hi. Now, um, my um, other connection with Isla is my son actually worked there for a while. Um, he worked in um, you know, the Gaelic place. Um, he was he was working there for a time too. Um, so I, uh, I went to see him while he was there. Um, that's a number of years ago. He's since moved on. He's now uh, uh, gradually moving more north. He's now in Sky. Uh, at the moment, who works in staffing in the, for the community trust there. So that's my knowledge of Isla, apart from clearly my taste buds have acquired knowledge on a number of occasions over the years. Uh, I've always been fascinated uh, by Peatland. Um, I think, you know, lots and lots of reasons for that, in that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we used to spend... I used to curse the fact we spent most of our summer holidays out there. Um, we would go out there, uh, you know, from about the, I was about 13, 14. I was brought up, but quite unusually, I was brought up by my dad. And uh, we had an uncle in the house too. So I was brought up in a, men only, in a male only household. I wasn't actually brought up, there was no, my, uh, my mother wasn't on the scene. So I was brought up by my dad and my uncle. So my brother and I used to regularly help out uh, going out to the moorland um, and cut peats, um, you know, from fairly early on, I think about 12, 13, uh, I used to go out there, uh, you know, move the turf from them and then, you know, uh, help my dad and my uncle to uh, dig them. I had the easy task. I was never given the hard task. I was the man... He used to cut his dad's fingers um, while um, uh, we were, um, uh, well, you know, he bent down below and he lifted them and heaved them into position. I was the one who was uh, slightly sadistic, well, actually clumsy one, and sadistic. He used to cut him quite regularly as I worked along that way. Um, and then, of course, when we had cut them, we used to put them into these stacks. And to, um, uh, you know, initially, then we used to, uh, you know, lift them again, change direction. Um, it was quite a fun way to have a summer holiday sometimes. Um, and then you put in a wheelbarrow, cross a wooden bridge, and then finally we would have uh, the peats coming home, um, you know, later on in the year. And that was 
a marvelous occasion in some ways. I'm, I'm being slightly sarcastic about the about the enjoyable aspects of the rest, but um, when you know because they're all a lot of the men and the women of the village used to help out, and they used to go and fill the trailer, and others used to go and uh, you know build the stack at the house, um, and that was a very festive occasion. That was. Uh, um, you know, I, there were gatherings all over the place. And of course, you went out to help them too. So I was doing that from a fairly early age and being rewarded with uh, scones and cake and duff, which was the Lewis speciality, you know, for taking part in these enterprises. The other way I got to know the Moor was from a very early age. I had a, an uncle, Alec, um, uh, my, who was my aunt's, well, great uncle, uh, who was my grandmother's sister's husband. Um, and he used to take me out to the moor too from about the age of six or seven when they went to gather sheep. Now, I don't think that was unusual at the time. You know, the sheep, the, the nest moor is quite an expansive moor. I think the barrest moor is, um, or the nest moor is um, among the top three in terms of size. Um, the, I think that actually is number two, if I remember rightly. Uh, number one is uh, the case nest, you know, the flow is the flow country there in terms of size. Barvis Muir is, I think, number two. And also, um, uh, I think, uh, yep, the island of Yell, not far from here in Shetland, uh, in mainland Shetland, is number three in terms of sheer. Uh, scale of peatland, and one of the reasons why they did contemplate in the 60s and 70s having peat power stations in all these areas at one time. Uh, so that, I think, is the source of the inspiration. Uh, I also had a great uncle, Alan, who would have been, again, uh, my grandmother's brother, in this case, who was crippled down one side of his body. Now, according to the story that uh, was that he had become crippled when he went out to um, uh, Liverpool to join the, uh, the First World War, and he had somehow acquired rheumatic fever. But he was known throughout the island as somebody who could identify virtually every sheep. Um, he knew uh, not just the colours of these sheep, but the earmarks that they used to have on the sheep. Uh, there were different earmarks. And, uh, you know, there was a cut. Sometimes a cut at the top of the sheep, cut at the bottom. I think that was ours. Uh, that's why I remember that one. Um, so he knew... You know, so he used to go around the moor from a very early age, you know, had clearly a very unfortunate life, you know, from, from his teens, you know, having this, you know, being paralysed on one side. But uh, he used to wander the moor. And, and, and well, you know, one wonders why he spent so long wandering the moor. Um, you know, I think sometimes it would have been to give... Give his sister the chance and, and his sister and her husband the chance to uh, just to bring up their own children in, in peace and without any great, um, uh, you know, bother. So uh, that might have been a reason for that. But he was renowned in the district for his knowledge of the Maryland. He was the one who, the, he was the go-to person. I remember, you know, as a primary school child, my my. Uh, prim in my primary school teacher, uh, you know, uh, talking about my great uncle and, and how he was by far the best shepherd in the district. And I remember feeling, um, you know, puffed up with pride about that. So I think that was the beginning of my love affair with, Mer with the Merland. I have to say, um, I also had, a, when I was in my last. No, I think my second last year in school, I had this romantic relationship with this girl um, from Stornoy. And uh, she um, gave me a present uh, for my 
birthday. I think probably my 16th birthday. Uh, and uh, it was Corgi Modern Poets, collections of Corgi Modern Poets. And um, I remember there was Ian Kyken Smith was in it, Philip Larkin was in it, and um, Tom Gunn and Seamus Heaney was in that collection. And I, first of all, I didn't want to read the books. You know, when you're about 16, and uh, you, you, but the last thing you want to do is, you know, read verse. I mean, uh, you could, you know, I read, you know, lots of novels and, and non-fiction, but, but the idea of reading poetry, but I thought I'd, if I wanted to maintain my relationship with her, uh, I'd better sit down and read this book. Um, and I remember loving it. I remember loving the Seamus Heaney poems at that time. And it was his early poetry. He wasn't, he wasn't about that time. He wasn't a terribly well-known uh, poet. You know, it was, you know, I remember Death of a Naturalist being in that book. And I remember Digging, for instance. It was very much his early poetry. And that, I think, cemented my relationship. That's, that's the wrong word to use, but cemented my relationship with the Moorland. Um, in that I could see uh, that, you know, that you, you, you could draw from that. You could draw from, um, you know, island life. And I remember thinking, you know, the other person I remember very much, well, it was Ian Clayton Smith too, who had obviously gone to the same secondary school as me, but also uh, the other one I remember reading at that time was George Mackay Brown, similar effects on me. The fact that these people were all islanders and writing books, you know, were fantastic. And uh, I also, I think, became aware that they were all subject to the same kind of linguistic tensions that I had, you know, all of them. Um, you know, Ian Crichton Smith uh, came more clearly from a Gaelic speaking background, um, uh, you know, growing up in Lewis. Um, Seamus Heaney, uh, I, I remember reading that he, his, you know, his mother was very much Ulster industrial classes, but his father was very much the Gaelic agricultural, you know, part of Donegal. There was a tension there. The last one, of course, was George Mackay Brown and uh, Arcadians will never tell you this. So this is a secret, okay? Right. It says, if you keep this nice and quiet, George Mackay Brown had, of course, a Gaelic-speaking mother from Sutherland. I think that's what lies behind an awful lot of his writing, in that he's got that exactness that comes from first-generation English speakers that, you know, you know, uh, Crichton Smith and, and Heaney and, you know, we could go with Dylan Thomas and Norman McCaig. We could mention all of these names uh, in that, uh, you know, in that same bag. But Heaney, I think, allowed me to think of the Moorland in a very, very different way uh, from, uh, you know, the the normal way of seeing it. I think, you know, uh, before that, I suppose if I thought of Moorland at all, it was a place of work, a place of labour. It was also a place where murders, murderers frequented. Uh, because the other thing, of course, about Lewis is uh, the Moorland was meant to be the abode of a guy called Mackenthorny. Any of you heard of that guy? Um, Mac yes, I yes, see. Uh, Mackenthorny was uh, this uh, murderer, uh, 19th century murderer who uh, came from Gav, outside, I think just outside Gav on the Scottish mainland. Uh, the name, I, I, we used to be told that uh, he got the name uh, Thorny because he bit someone's nose, but in fact, you know, his surname was Thorny. And there were a lot of tales of that kind. But Moorland, you know, murders, uh, Moorland ghosts, lights appearing on the moor. But Heaney, I think, taught me to, you know, when I read his work, and, you know, particularly even later on when I read 
as what they were, um, the log bodies and, and you know, this as work taught me to see him in an entirely different way. So I, I owe him a great debt of gratitude. I did meet him on one occasion. I was very lucky uh, to meet him in, in Rasi and we spent time together in the soul more off the sky. Um, and that was just a lovely conversation. So uh, I, I really enjoyed you know, spending, spending a night drinking, I have to say, with Seamus Heaney. Um, and probably the most worthwhile thing that I have ever had in my entire life. Probably the only worthwhile thing I've ever had in my entire life. So the, that is, I think, how I came to see the Moorland differently, you know, from most of my acquaintances. And if that makes any sense. Any questions? I, I know that was quite rambling and, and uh, yeah, about that. Uh, I think the evidence, you know, funny enough, this is my earliest collection of short stories. And I think I was in my 20s, 30s when I wrote some of them way back. And um, uh, it, it's a book called Special Deliverance. And uh, uh, it cost it cost four pound ninety five at the time, but I quite fascinated with Margaret Thatcher's idea of I think you know getting rid of Liverpool was certainly one of uh, you know because there was a riot in Liverpool, and uh, I so I, I kind of wrote this short story which appeared in in Radical Scotland, which was about uh, the clearance of Liverpool. Uh, and sending them all out to uh, Lewis Moore uh, in order to cut peats, <laughs> um, to be taught how to cut peats. So that, that was probably one of my earlier stories about the Moorland, but it was a lot, you know, you know, from, from early days in that. Okay. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'll, I'll pause every so often to invite questions. You know, so. Yes. Oh, there's a question from Vanessa in the chat for you. Yeah. Hi, yeah, I just um I've just come back from the Isles of Harris and Lewis actually just two days ago and I'm missing it so much already. And um I've just started writing and um you know very much on the beginning of the journey. And I would love to know your process for how you go about writing a poem. Um, do you have like a particular process you go through or does it just come to you like in moments of inspiration? I'd just love to know because I'm, I'm still really early days on this. Uh, I think I do have a process, um, I, but it's, it's almost an accidental one. And, and um, I, you know, for writing a poem, I often find that I go out walking and uh, that's when I start, I think, there's something about the rhythm of walking, uh, even the rhythm, I always think, for instance, uh, I used to teach, um, you know, I was a, an English teacher for years, and I used to teach about the iam iambic pentameter, and afterwards I suddenly realized the appeal of the iambic pentameter is actually because it imitates the rhythms of the human heart. And I think there's something about that in walking to the simple act of walking. So this, for instance, is, you know, it's, it's quite a slight collection of poems. I wrote in um, on lockdown, this is the one uh, which Angus mentioned earlier, which is called a bit of, uh, The Man Who Talks to Birds. I found what I was doing was I was just walking around and observing, uh, you know, I have here now. Here it's largely moor. Um, uh, I do miss part of Lewis and Harris when I say I miss most. It's, it's probably walking in the Macha and you know the shoreline there, which I think is, is lovely here. Whereas here there's not much of that, but uh, you you know the moorland itself is, is interesting. So these are the kind of things. So there was a damp day, uh, and and in the uh, in May, and sorry, in June, which I wrote about, each clump of heather, a clenched fish fist, punching its weight out from peat. Each knotted stems, a twisted muscle,
drawing strength from the stored heat of darkness, the layers of centuries rot and decay, loss and grief, until in August it alters shade, no longer strictly brown or green, a mingling of leaves, but with burnished red and purple flowers, as if in some as if some blood bloodshed in the past from the earth has seeped. Uh, and you you know, for instance, so that and and I, I think the other thing is you don't worry about repeating yourself. Um, if you do repeat yourself, go with it. Uh, you just write. So for instance, uh, another one I did about about a, a misty day. Um, I don't know if you watch when you walk along uh, Heather and you see how spiders' webs have cloaked stalks of Heather. Um, and that's, um, this one was in May. Today I noticed on my morning walk how cobwebs can lace together Heather stalks on still days like these. Spiders imitating clouds that clamp us down, knitting funeral shrouds for insects, scrambling round the edges of moor, mimicking that mist we sometimes feel has trapped us in this village, having strolled these same roads a thousand times before. So don't you don't worry about repeating yourself. You just go with it. Um, and I, I always think if you can get the rhythm of the first line in your head, things will flow from that. Is that helpful, Vanessa? I, 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 I do think it's walking. I think that kind of physical exercise. I find yeah. it. And I'm sitting here for a long time trying to think of a version. I can't write it. But I can write prose sitting here. Um, I can't, however, write verse. That's really helpful, thank you. And yeah, one of the things I've been doing over the last 10 days is a lot of walking. And yes. it's funny how you get that inspiration that comes to you when you're out and about, isn't it? Yes. I just need to think about. And in many ways, you're also kind of, you know, you know we, we all have troubles. Every one of us have our occasional you know, doubts and troubles. In a way, by walking, you, you can almost shed these troubles. You, you know, there's something about the simplicity of walking that allows you to do that. So it allows you to concentrate on, on, on what seeing around you. That's it. Could I ask Donald, do you think the lockdown was a particularly conducive period to writing in general? I mean, did I you, because there wasn't much else to do apart from walking and... I thought, I thought it was great. Um, <laughs> uh, particularly at the beginning, not so much towards the end. You know, I've, I've also been teaching. Uh, they've had problems getting staff in, in the Anderson High and Lerwick and English staff. And I, I've been going in uh, the last wee while and I've been doing quite a lot of teaching there, you know, because they they're, they're still short of staff at the moment. So during um, the lockdown period, I wrote this, you know, it's again, quite a slim collection of uh, uh, poetry. I also wrote the bulk of a book about lighthouses, which is out coming out in July, I think July the 29th, which is it's going to be an absolutely gorgeous book. I mean, it's just, uh, um, it, it's, um, I think it's 100 images of lighthouses all around the Scottish coastline, including some from Ireland, I think, if, I, if, I might, if my memory serves me well. Um, so, you know, so there, there, there's that, I wrote that book, and that was about 60,000 words um, in that book, you know, talking about what lighthouses meant to me, because in a sense, I also grew up, um, I grew up near the Butte Lewis Lighthouse, and that was just in the corner of my eye when I grew up. I also worked for a while in the US in Bedbecula, and I could see the Monarch Islands Lighthouse. And if I look outside the window, I can see the present lighthouse here in my view. So again, I, I, I felt quite inspired about that. I'll, I'll, can I read a wee bit of a novella mist which talks about the moorland? Is that, is that all right? Because uh, 
This is my other book that I wrote during lockdown. And it's about one of the characters is Jessie, uh, who is a single woman whose uh, boyfriend left her to go on the Metagama in the 1920s and disappeared, despite the fact, and she waited for him, you know, many, many decades in the hope that he would invite her to go to Canada or the States with her. But she also is based on a lot of older women I knew. Um, when I grew up in the village, we had an awful lot of single women in the village. Uh, sometimes uh, widows you know, had lost men in the First World War or, or you know, some of the other things. The other thing they had was um, uh, the, uh, the woman too were, um, some of the, I was one or two of the women who would go out to the moor and collect things. Uh, and so this is about, about what they used to gather out there. It was Mary, mainly, sorry, Wusnaloi or Bogby that she gathered near the edge of the rocks. The trick was to pull the plants out by the roots shortly after their white feathery flower had died away, their fruits having formed. After this, they would be cleaned and boiled, simmering away for a couple of hours in a pan before the liquid was steamed, was squeezed, sorry, stained and bottled. A number of people took this in the village, believing it cured all their ills and, the, uh, Ills and ailments. Some would even hold their noses as they swallowed the potion, gulping as they swiped it down. It's a lot better than pills from Dr. Gillis or Dr. Macaulay. Much, much better. Goodness knows what might happen if their medicines ever stop working and we've forgotten all about what we've used for centuries before. I was thinking actually in some ways about the lockdown about the coronavirus and I kind of wrote that sentence. There were other flowers too she lifted as she walked along. The yellow flowers of torment Hill had sometimes gleamed alongside a peat track. She had heard this call by two names. Brennan Frey or Brennan Vatagur, she preferred the second name, summoning up visions of the fox for her, patrolling the borders of North Tulsa. It's I, perhaps, and the sheep that grazed there, rather than a reminder of the heather that was all around her. It was used when someone was suffering diarrhea, and it was for John's ward. Akwashen Kalankila, actually, Akwashen. Yes, uh, armpits, sorry, elbows, aquas, yeah, uh, here at St. Columbus, to cheer people up when they felt miserable and low. Occasionally in patches of green, there was self heal growing, us free, which despite its name was good for sore throats and wounds. She loved the way too that both weather and season um, played with the shades, mingling, mixing and mingling changing the moor's hues from brown to green, sometimes sprinkling other colours within its length and bread. She plucked these plants, occasionally sipping water from a, a stream she knew fresh and, she knew run fresh and clear, bending down to cup it in her palm. All the time she was conscious of the birds around her, their flights attending each side of her walk. She could see a group of ravens picking away at something at the edge of a loch, walked, watched by a seagull that followed her every move. For a moment, she wondered if they might have swooped down on another monkey or chubby little rat swept in on the tide. I'll have to explain the background to that later. Tearing its flesh till bone was exposed, but she shook her head, chasing the thought from her head. Instead, she glanced at a curlew a short distance away, probing peat or mud before tugging out its prey with a wriggle of its bill. There was also a heron standing on what wonder that, upright and weary. From time to time it appeared to gaze in her direction in a, ma a maniacal way, its yellow eyes glaring as if it were one of those busy bodies from the village watching everybody else's moves. So, um, that's you know, uh, you know, that would have been 
you know, certainly the lives of my ancestors would have gone out to the moorland, you know, for these reasons. They would have collected various flowers and, and uh, you know, for various purposes and medicines. And we've kind of lost touch with that, as that's my idea. So I had the character of Jesse um, doing that. I noticed Ina's asked me a question there. Yeah. Uh, and I, does the Gaelic language particularly lend itself to writing about peatlands? Do you think? I think it probably does because it, it has this kind of a knowledge to it, you know, um, but not, you know, not exclusively so. Um, I should put it. You know, in Gaelic music, there's an awful lot of songs about, you know, for instance, Lewis is always described as an Andrej, the Heather Island. Uh, there's a lot of songs about uh, the moorland, uh, and, and I contain one or two of them in the book, which has kind of inspired my music. Um, but it's, I, I can't think of many English equivalents, uh, you know, apart from, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, the more famous ones like the Bronte sister, works of the Bronte sister, something like that. But I can't think of many English equivalents of that. Uh, but certainly in terms of song, there's a fair number in Gaelic. Um, you know, the, the song's a bit, a bit landscape. Yeah. Just seeing if there's any questions for you, Kim. So. Well, if, uh, maybe I could sort of, uh, another great theme in, apart from the inspiration of the landscape, the particular sort of endlessly vary, variable land, landscape of moorland in Scotland, um, another great theme is a particular tradition of peat cutting, yeah. taking home the peats, the collective effort. Maybe you could chat a little bit about that, because I think for anybody who hasn't experienced that, it's, it's, I think it's difficult to, to understand what a, an important part of the year and how it framed the year in the Hebrides for really right up until the 1970s, I, I would say. I think even, you know, possibly even later, yeah, it would have been, I think it started dying away in about the early 80s, actually, in Lewis, I, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know, to say, um, I, I think people wanted, it started, I think, at that time, they wanted holidays, they wanted breaks away from the landscape, um, you know, uh, the, you know, things like going to the continent started being mentioned, you know, before that, um, they certainly went, you know, before that time, your holiday was on the moor. And another thing which I didn't mention when I was talking about peat cutting was, of course, there was the abbey, there was the shilling, where they went out in the, in the moor. So, for instance, my ancestors would have gone out uh, uh, particularly the woman in the family and the children in the family would have gone out to the, the shearing out in the moor. Now, there were a number of benefits to that. It allowed the land, um, that the land a time to recover, you know, because you didn't have the sheep grazing there, you didn't have the cattle grazing, but you took them out in the moor with them. Um, and again, I suppose it, it let the men, you know, get on with the agricultural work, um, you know, working in, you know, particularly turnips, you know, potatoes, these kind of things. So the moor became, um, you know, that break for them. It also became a very romantic destination um, because uh, you would find that... Uh, you know, again, I'm looking at my ancestors. Uh, that my, um, uh, uh, you know, I think my uh, there was certainly my my grandmother's people. No, my you know my great grandmother's people. They came from Tosta on the other side of the moor, um, and that was true of an awful lot of the ones in the villages of Ness. Uh, it kind of, you know. Uh, it widened your romantic field. Uh, it widened your ch uh, chance of having part, uh, you know, again, a partner, because the, the difficulty, of course, was uh, particularly if you came from a small community, there was danger of, you know, kind of, a, you know, you know, being married to or uh, becoming involved with a close relative. So by going across the moor, it was allowed you to uh, meet people that you would not normally meet. So you would get that 
in, you know, there would be an awful lot of, of that. Um, I, I think there was a kind of, how should I put it, there was a mayhem allowed there. Um, uh, to some extent, you know, that, um, you know, in the, in the Presbyterian villages of Lewis, uh, would have been clamped down on. Uh, so, you know, in a way, you were away from the eyes of your community and you could indulge yourself in a little mischief if you chose to do so. Uh, so I think that is another reason for its appeal. Um, I don't know if that, uh, if that was a pattern in iLab, did they have shillings in the moor there? Or not, you know. Um, I know I went to the... I, there, Donald, Donald there, there's a big cave over beyond Bunahaven yeah. and around the north end of Isla. It's called the Sheeling and it's a huge cave. Um, yeah. And you've got walls and stuff around it. So it's obvious that people would have taken their beasts and stuff out yeah. to the area like that. And there's ruins, buildings and stuff. I, I went to, I, when I went to Faroe Island, um, you know, a number of years ago, I, I you know, uh, there was, a, a, I think, a professor of Peruese or something who was absolutely desperate to question me. And he had a whole list of Peruese uh, uh, words uh, where there was an equivalent in Scottish Gaelic. You know, for instance, you know, we'd have the word taraf or bull. Uh, they'd have the word tarver, and I remember them coming out with the word adi or something similar to it. You know, the Faroese had shillings out in the Shetlanders didn't. Uh, you know, Shetlanders, that tradition, you know, wasn't here, whereas it was in Lewis. Uh, you know, I think, you know, one of the things we forget, of course, is that the closest island to the Faroe Islands is not Shetland. Uh, again, a bit of whisper for that, because it, it was actually North Warnap, which was part of, you know, my community at one time. So that was something else that, uh, that was a tradition. I think we were very lucky in Scotland in terms of how we have the moon. And that's one of the themes I write about in, in, in the dark stuff. Uh, in that, you know, it wasn't seen as a place of punishment. It may have been slightly chilling place. It may have been the place where we, you know, envisaged murders and go to wonder, you know, particularly in winter. Um, but when you go to the continent, it becomes very, very clear that they regarded the moorland in a very different way. And for instance, you know, uh, part of the thing I write about Netherlands, which at one time was, was just about all peatland at one you know, stage, uh, only, there's only a small section of it now, but they, they used uh, their peatland as a way of, how should I put it, reforming um, some of the criminal tendencies of thieves, of prostitutes, of alcohol, you know, go out, get them to cut peats in community. In Germany, uh, many of the initial concentration camps and prison camps were in fact peat cutting camps. Peat, uh, peat cup, uh, cutting camps, you know, East, East Lewigen, which is right on the German-Dutch border, which I went to see, was one of the first uh, concentration camps where Hitler all his political opponents uh, in there tend to be socialist, the occasional Jewish uh, individual. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, that was their punishment, was cutting peat. You know, Dashaw was at one time an artistic uh, peat uh, colony. Now, I understand that this was also the case in Russia, where yeah, you know, that was part of their punishment, was killing, sorry, was sending people out, you know, to cut the peat in, in terms of punishment. In Scotland, we never had that, because I think we were very lucky in having coal 
we even had coal in the strangest of locations like Brora, uh, would be the, the the most northerly place. My ancestors were uh, certainly you know came from the Dorna Firth area, and there is a, there is a tale that I can tell about that. But um, you know they had coal. Um, countries like the Netherlands, much of Germany, didn't have coal. Didn't have. Uh, so, in fact, it was more difficult for them to have an industrial revolution uh, than, than we had. So I think we were very lucky uh, that, in a sense, peat was not the basis of our economy in the same way as it was in the Netherlands, for instance, for, for centuries. You know, most, most of the peatland of the Netherlands has disappeared because it was used for brewing, it was used for distilling. Uh, it was used for punishment, and I, you know, I, one of the things, one of the oddest things I find about this book is that I get as many inquiries from the Netherlands about it as I do from Scotland. I get an awful lot of inquiries from the Netherlands, and they seem to regard, you know, Peter very important. I also, of course, get inquiries from Ireland too. Um, the, 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 the dark stuff in the sense, as, as I had, to my mind, has had a greater impact in, in the Netherlands, uh, judging of the correspondence I have had than it's had in, in, in Scotland. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's, I think they lost the peatland. They lost it. You know, uh, it's scientists and ecologists from the Netherlands who were actually behind uh, you know, the attempts to, you know, for Ireland to, to stop cutting peat. I mean, Ireland, you know, went down, uh, you know, the, the peat power road in a way that, you know, you know Scotland avoided. It, it nearly happened in Scotland. As I say, it nearly happened in places like the Flows and in the Barrett's Moor and also in Yell and Shetland. But somehow, you know, perhaps because of incompetence, it never occurred. I think we're very, very lucky. Wasn't it, wasn't it because we had this model of um, subsistence farming, of yeah. crofting, that, that protected the, the much of the peatland area in Scotland? Yes. But it, it now raises an interesting question, I always think, that <sighs> yes, Scotland didn't destroy the peatlands in the way because people were only taking a little bit every year yeah. it was growing back to some extent but now we're at five minutes to midnight in a climate yeah. emergency what do you think about should we stop cutting peat at all but even if it's a very marginal thing it is a, you know everybody's under pressure to do what they can for yeah. the climate emergency um, what do you think not, about that well as i say i, I think scotland as i said was very fortunate it, 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 you know, in many ways, it didn't have to deal with the peat, didn't have to use it as an economic asset because they had the coal. Uh, I would hate the thought of telling my, uh, you know, my friends and neighbours that we shouldn't cut peat anymore, especially when I know that so many of them are suffering from you know, fuel poverty. We know it's an issue, for instance, an issue in, in, in Shetland, it's an issue in the Western Isles. Uh, and until I think we grapple with that issue, you know, I mean, one of the you know, kind of ironies of, of uh, no longer cutting peat is, is in a sense, uh, you know, places like the Western Isles have moved from being fuel rich areas. Uh, to nowadays where their dependence on oil become, you know, fuel poverty areas, you know, that's, and, and, and I think there's a huge, there's a huge issue there. And I, I, I would say we have to come up with a solution to that issue before we go in and lecture them about not to cut repeat. That's my view, Angus. Um, but, you know, I have but, to say, uh, sorry, yes. As a, as a kind of conservationist sort of thing, and I've walked Isla's peatland across areas where people have cut peats. Yes. And I always find that the depressions where they're let, you know, where the peats have been cut are always often the wettest areas and actually are creating more peat than kind of, if you say not to cut at all. So yes. I don't, you know, small cuttings, I never see it as a, an issue. An issue, no. Or a wider kind of 
climate issue or anything because it creates its own habitat and kind of um, nurtures a lot of the, the wetter areas for the plants that need it. Yeah. So there's always recovery after the cut. Yes, and that's great. I'll have to, I'll store that answer myself <laughs> the next time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've walked, I I walked across it. <laughs> yeah, I walked across an area surveying today and it's been heavily cut for peat yes. in the past. But you walk across it and despite, you know, some moderate grazing by cattle, it's deep cushions of sphagnum mosses, which are yes. the thing yes. that create yes. peat. So yes. it'll recover in the end. It's yes. the vast, you know, it's the vast fields of peat that gets cut for the gardens and that sort of thing is, is the issue. Yeah. So. It's, I mean, my father was, you know, meticulous in the way, you know, I have worked in, in, in with other crofters who weren't quite as meticulous as, um, you know, every single, you know, the terms of peat were put down in um, the right position. Uh, certainly when I came from the great deal of pride in that, I remember, you know, uh, woman, I remember a woman in the village going out with a cloth to wipe the peat bank clean at the end of every year, you know, there, there was some real pride in, in, in uh, how you, know, you looked after the peat bank. That wasn't true in every community because I have worked in others which will remain nameless uh, where that wasn't the case. That was not, um, you know, that, that, that they didn't have the same sort of nurture their, their landscape in the same way. What, uh, the other book in which I used uh, for, uh, just uh, uh, the peak as I kind of an idea was uh, you know, the one that's been I think one of my most successful is um, as a woman they dreaming but I have the young boy looking at the very beginning and he sees the peat man when he comes to Lewis after his, after his mother's death as, as his desolate empty space and yet when he goes and he's been strengthened by his time in Lewis. You know, he sees the Merland in all its riches. And, you know, in some ways, I suppose that's me. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I only came to Lewis, live in Lewis when I was seven. And I remember absolutely fascinated by, um, uh, you know, we'd go, uh, uh, you know, down the, uh, uh, you know, well, or Farabat, which is not far from the thing, and there would be the Scharn, well, I the turn, the Arctic turn, Scharn, I can, he said they would come down, uh, fly down, and you pester, you almost, you know, uh, give you a haircut when you would uh, cross there. Uh, you would see the lap wings coming up, the Kulahak, uh, you know, uh, going up. Uh, and I, you know, it was a different landscape. The curled you, you know, I was telling Angus that. You know, when I um, when I was a child, my, my father used to um, uh, use the sense the, the landscape. He would go out and play football, you know, this time of year, and he would say to me, he got me, not when he used to, go up on that and his, come home when you hear the curlew of the snipe. And when you were playing football, uh, in the twilight, you know, in the twilight, you know, it was as if the curlew and the snipe were blowing the final whistle for your game. Uh, you were, you knew you were coming up to about nine o'clock, and it was time perhaps to go home and get ready for tomorrow. Uh, nine, you know, nine ten even, uh, you know, in, in in midsummer, and so you would go home then. That was that was your time for going home and for playing football. Not that I was any good at playing football, but you know, uh, it's uh, uh, and I think all of that added to you know, uh, you know, a childhood. In, you know, in some ways, I was brought up to take note of nature. You know, I was I was taught to observe it, and and uh, from a fairly early age, uh, I kind of loved observing. Again, it would be a bit like my Seamus Heaney poetry. I wouldn't have told any of my mates that I was particularly interested in birds and, and uh, things like that. But it was definitely in there. I just loved watching the birds. I loved watching the wildlife. 
think I can hear the the curlew calling the final whistle on our. <laughs> yes. I, I wonder, did you have any more readings for us, Donald? Uh, maybe, not well, that. I, I mean, I've, I've got plenty. But that that I'll, well, I read one from the the man who talks to birds. I won't I won't even sure. Um, Again, it's about peat, and they're not all about peat, by the way, an awful lot. Some are about birds, and some are about uh, just kind of philosophical, but there's about three or four, which is about um, peat. And this is, uh, this is in, again in June. Behind our house, fog caught in white, in the peat dark ground, star and comet bright, shining when both rain and cloud grind earth locked spirits down and then a twist of road a slow swear round a corner flakes of sun are found within a field of buttercups in a sodden stretch of ground with glimpse of tormentor a rare monkey flower the blackbird's yellow beak pecking at the greenness of our mood with its mellow range of sounds. This is the quaff here in Shetland. It's the only place I think in all of North Scotland where they have monkey flowers in the day, in the drain, uh, in the ditches. Uh, and you see them. I didn't know what they were, you know, I just knew I'd never seen them before. But they're like giant buttercups. That's uh, so I, again I loved I loved seeing them. Um, well, that was very nice, Donald. It's very resonant of Isla at the moment, where the, the bog, bog cotton is, is is in full flower or, or flower. I don't know if that's the right word, but um, the bog cotton's everywhere at the moment. So um, I'll pass over to Fiona to wrap things up, I think. Thank you, Angus. Um, thank you very much, Donald, for that. That was, uh, it's nice to see sort of how you work with poetry and how you observe and put that into verse. So, um, I think it's, I, 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 I know I do a wee bit of poetry myself and I was walking across the bog the other day and I was sort of walking through, finding a nice deer track and so <laughs> how difficult it is to walk when you don't find a deer track and all sorts and it was quite, uh, quite good. I was thinking a few things in my head that was walking and yes, I think it is walking. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Oh, that was a very good tip for writing. You've got to get out walking. Out walking. I do, I do think it works for me anyway, you know, it's, it's that's a, that's it's quite different from Bernard McLaverty when when he was was it in 2019 I think he was at the Isla Book Festival and he recommended put, sitting in, in a room putting the blinds down and put your desk against a wall. I see it. but he's primarily a prose writer and I think there is that I think there is that and he's a fantastic prose writer and again he's somebody whose work I really enjoyed you know when I was a young lad uh, coming up you know. Uh, and again, I said you identify him because I was an English teacher too. Um, so, uh, I think I think if you're going to write about nature and what you see, particularly on peatland or out and about, is you have to get out there and and, and see yeah. it and what yes. feel it. So, yes. Yeah, it's lovely. It's, uh -huh. it's lovely. So, and, and it helps you lose weight too, you know, because it's, it's <laughs> I do put on weight slightly in the summer. Okay, so. Half a leaf, I was damn it, I was going to be on the Ely, no. She was on the track work, I was a painless, can you just me on the Nahurish? I am not listening to me, I am here a couple on the hoik, Facebook, I said for me on Swan, I was following as Koshok Chimil. Okay, tap a leaf. Thank you. I thought I would just finish with Gary. Thank, thank you, Donald. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Thank Take care. Bye.